Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, morning it is. It is. It's morning. Evening. Heavens. <laughs> and, well, yeah, okay, might feel like evening. Maybe it's getting towards the conference. Um, yeah, and welcome to uh, the uh, next morning session. Um, we're doing uh, mentoring for fun and profit. And Leslie Hawthorne, who's, uh, who comes from us from Google. And uh, without more ado, leave it. Leslie, go. Thanks, Graham. Good morning, everyone. Wow, I'm really loud. I'm going to do that. Thank you. There we go. I'm loud by nature, so I'm always a little sensitive to it. So uh, as Graham just mentioned, I'm a program manager for Google's Open Source Programs Office, and I'm here to talk today a little bit about mentoring in open source communities. Um, I'm going to be sharing some of my experience working with the FOSS community for the past five years, as well as uh, particularly experiences working with the communities built up around Google's student programs for open source the Google Summer of Code program, and the Google Highly Open Participation Contest, which is for pre-university students. Um, <clears throat> that being said, these are my experiences and my opinions, uh, not those of any past, present, or future employer, and of course, your mileage may vary. And in cases where your mileage varies, please let me know so that I can improve this presentation. So, getting started. Why mentor? Um, I think probably a lot of the folks in the audience wonder why you would even ask this question. And actually, I think it's something that is definitely worth addressing because we generally tend to feel like we're all very good people and we do want to help other people. But, you know, there's actually a cost to giving that sort of assistance. And particularly, I'm thinking back to a post I saw on the Geek Feminism blog about privilege and the way that folks who have privilege tend not to acknowledge that they have privilege. And one of the responses in the comments was, well, don't you think it's very unreasonable that you're asking people who work in volunteer communities in their spare time to take even more of that spare time helping other people to get better at what they're doing when they could spend that time doing good work. And, you know, you read that and you think maybe this person's being a bit of a jerk. But in reality, you take a lot of time. You take a lot of patience. You take a lot of energy to acquire all that arcane lore to be successful in your project. So maybe it doesn't really occur to you why it's useful to you to spend that time helping other people get to where you are. So let's talk a little bit about why it's useful. That is, in fact, a Lego bus, which is very cool. Um, so we've all heard the term bus factor. For those of the audience who may not have heard it or who are watching the video, bus factor is the idea that how many people getting hit by a bus would it take for your project to completely fall apart? And in some cases, that's quite a few people. And for some projects, that's one person, and that's it. And the idea here is mentoring helps you to, uh, I guess, increase your bus factor is the correct term here. The more people who know how to help your project be successful, the more people that you have on hand should life simply happen to one of your key contributors. People go on vacation. People suddenly start a family. Uh, people have health problems. Life just happens. And by actually taking the time to mentor new individuals coming into your community, you have the assurance that should life happen, you have a few more hands to help with the work. Bus factor is something that's talked about a lot. But a topic that I think is addressed far less, less often is burnout. And I think burnout is actually a real problem in open source communities. Project leaders and folks who have been in communities for a really long time work very, very hard because they're incredibly passionate about what they're doing. And that's wonderful. And the problem that occurs is when you're a busy person, you tend to get busier because people know that you're capable and because people really want your help. And you know, typically the natural human inclination is to want to give that help. And when it's a really good and worthy cause, it's very hard to say no. And the difficulty then can be that you wake up a couple years later and realize that you haven't taken a vacation, you haven't really talked to your significant other Wait, your significant other has left, and you didn't actually notice that they'd moved out three months ago. And <laughs> you haven't heard from your mom in a while, and she's actually left several messages on your voicemail wondering if you're still alive. And by the way, your hands hurt and you can't type anymore. Mentoring helps you avoid burnout in a couple of ways. We'll talk a little bit about the emotional way in a moment. But certainly, just again, having more hands to help is going to assist you with that. Uh, another thing that is worth noting uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the cool work that my friends are doing. Uh, Ashish Loria and company, uh, I don't know if any of you folks are familiar with him, he used to work for the Creative Commons Project, is putting together a project right now called Open Hatch, 
which is specifically a program tar targeted to helping newbies get involved in open source, but with the eventual goal of addressing the burnout problem. And OpenHatch is a way of getting open source projects to be able to feed into a centralized database, uh, easy bugs, good places for newbies to get started, and also tagging those things by language, by skill set, and a whole range of topics so that newbies are most able to access the information that they need to become productive contributors as they're first getting started and don't quite know how to find their feet. So I highly recommend that. It's openhatch.org. Check it out. So the real reason to mentor, though, is because it makes you feel good. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult to underestimate the value of being there for someone's aha moment. That, that time when they come to a sudden realization, all the uh, questioning falls away, they really get it. And, you know, think back to when you were a newbie, think back to when you were inexperienced, and that moment when suddenly you realized, oh my gosh, I've got it. Um, if anyone's seen that uh, play or movie, My Fair Lady, I think she's got it. I think she's got it. You too can have that moment, and I think that's actually one of the most profound reasons why mentoring is, is amazing, right? Because you get to have that opportunity to interact with someone when they're having that profound life experience. So hopefully I've convinced you that mentoring is a good thing, and that you too can run along sunny beaches feeling quite, quite ecstatic. So, all right, you want to get started mentoring. How do you do that? Step one, know your community. Um, you've all been together for a while. Some of you have been together longer than others. You all kind of know where everyone fits, right? Where all you are in the choir. Which voice corresponds to which skill set? Who knows what? And that's all very valuable data. But it's not just about technical skills and knowing that if someone needs to, you know, learn more about white space issues, they should really go and talk to so-and-so. It's also really about knowing personality traits, and where people's actual individual skills lie in interacting with other people. Another good thing to know about your community <clears throat> right off the bat, and this I think is something that's very important to identify early if you want to start on a, on a mentoring campaign, know those people in your community who are trolls or who are helpful in the wrong way through no fault of their own. And I bring this up because newbies tend to suffer disproportionately from interaction with folks who may not quite get it. Uh, they come in, they don't quite know what's going on, they're just getting started, and sometimes it's very sad, but the first person to jump up and say, I'm here to help you. Let me share my wisdom with you. Let me point you the way, is actually somebody who maybe is best not pointing the way. <clears throat> so if you're going to start up a mentoring program, uh, be aware that that's probably the first person who's gonna jump up and say, me, 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 me and think of a productive and polite way to address that. So you know your community. You know where to send people when they need help. Next, check your tone. You may think that you're smiling widely and presenting a wonderful face and look great like the dude in the business suit, and everyone thinks that you're this glowering, mean, awful person. I think the best example that I've ever seen of this was about two years back. Uh, we had just finished up the first Google Highly Open Participation Contest, which again is our program to introduce pre-university students to open source. And we had 10 different projects participating. And one project, the Plone Content Management System project, had chosen uh, their top student. And he happened to live about five miles from Google HQ. And it just so happened that they were having a sprint that weekend at Google HQ. So I got to call up uh, his mom and say, Constance, um, just so you know, Jonathan's won the grand prize. He's going to get a free trip to Google, which I can imagine is probably less interesting for him since he's five minutes away. But, um, you know, all of his friends are here this weekend, and they're having a conference. He should come down. So his mom brought him down, and they had a great day. They had lunch together. They got to hack together for a while. Jonathan got to give his first presentation to Eddie Group on the work that he'd done. And then at the end of the day, as everyone's sort of saying their goodbyes, um, the project lead turns up from some meetings he'd been in and is introduced to Jonathan's mom, Constance, and he just has this double take moment. And he goes, I don't know how to say this to you, but I, it's very important that I explain something to you. You, you may see stuff on, on our mailing list or, or in IRC where we're calling each other idiots, and maybe we're calling each other worse names than idiot, but 
But it's all because we know each other. We know each other really well. We've gotten together for, for dinners. We have beers together. We go to all of these conferences together. So when I call Martin an idiot, it's, it's just because we're friends and we know we can talk to each other that way. And, and, I, and I hope you realize that it's, it's not really a problem. And, and I hope you don't re think that we're, we're being unkind talking to each other that way in front of your son. And that's just it. Your community is filled with people who know each other, who talk to each other like they're very familiar with one another. And maybe sometimes your tone is a bit aggressive or seems hostile. The great ending to this story, though, is uh, Constance looking up. You know, Limmy's like six foot two, and she's much shorter and going, my son plays online games. Your mailing lists are nothing. <laughs> so just remember, check your tone. All right, and think about your ways to be welcoming. Um, I particularly love this sign because I think it is the best illustration that I have ever seen of RTFM syndrome. No tourists, but thank you for your collaboration. Right? As you're welcoming new people into your community, you want to make sure that you're actually welcoming. So. If someone asks a question that's an RTFM question, RTFM is probably not the best answer. Point them to the documentation. You may be surprised to learn that you have no documentation to point them to. That's a problem. Make sure you have well-written, accessible newbie documentation and make sure that that is plastered on the front of your website or wiki. If you want to you know, highlight it somehow or as a Denise and Mark were talking in their uh, talk yesterday about using a blink tag. You can do that. I'm not Web 2.0 savvy enough to know what the span is, so there you go. But in any case, ensure that your presence is actually welcoming to new contributors. All right, so you've thought about ways to improve your community. The most important one, ask for help. You don't realize what your blind spots are. It's completely impossible for those of us who've been doing anything for a long period of time to know what we don't know. And this is one of the places where newbies can be the most valuable to us because they walk in completely uninitiated, completely unacculturated, and the questions that they ask are great ways for you to know what your blind spots are. And if you haven't gotten quite gotten to the stage where newbies are coming into your project, ask one of your friends who doesn't work on your project. Even though they're already steeped in open source, they might be the person to tell you, you know, how. Uh, we're a, you know, you're an open source project and you want people to work on your code? Yeah. I couldn't really find your code without doing a Google search. There's no link to the source on your web page anywhere that's easily findable. Maybe that's a problem. Probably should fix it. All right. So, where do you find newbies? A Google search probably isn't going to help you. Sadly, search engines are not good for everything. Um, there are some of the usual suspect answers, like local uh, user group meetings are a great place to find newbies to help you out. You also want to make sure that when you're writing up, if you happen to be running a local user group, when you're writing up your announcements that the event is going on, don't just post them on the usual suspect places where you know FOSS people go. Use tools like, for example, upcoming.org to be most welcoming to folks so that they know, hey, something's going on locally. It has to do with computers. Your microphone fell off. <coughs> Mr. President, Mr. President, okay. Thank you, at least somebody left. Um, sorry. Uh, so make sure that it's obvious in your postings that new people are welcome. And when you're at those meetings, actually do calls for volunteers. Don't be afraid to say my project needs help and my project needs help from people at all skill levels. So if you don't know how to get started, I'm here to help you and I'd like your assistance to make my project better. Shameless plug time. Students are an excellent source of uh, code contributions and boundless energy for open source. If you have, uh, haven't taken the time to go down to your local college and talk to their local ACM or student computer club chapter, I highly recommend doing that. Uh, you would be shocked the number of folks who are thinking, if I have to deal with this stupid lab project that I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it in and I'm gonna get an A and I'm never gonna touch this code again and it's really boring and I finished it in five minutes. There are a lot of really smart people who feel that way. Help them not feel that way. And if your project is interested in getting involved in a full-scale mentoring program, uh, the Google Summer of Code program is available. We're happy to take applications from any project releasing code under an open source license. If you'd like more information on how that works, please let me know. Last but not least, if you're looking for new contributors, cultivate creativity. And what I mean is look for people 
in unusual places. Um, we have a lot of folks who talk to us about how some of their best contributions come from folks who write no code, but they thought it would be really cool to add an art file to their game because you know some of the sprites weren't quite as attractive as they thought they'd be. So why not reach out to a local artist group if you need artwork? How about your friend, the technical writer? Maybe she has some spare cycles in her spare time and she'd like to do something that will help beef up her resume. Why not ask her to do a documentation? Or even the local writer's guild. Sure, these folks are mostly writing fiction, but maybe they'd like to do some technical writing. Think outside the box for where to find your new contributors. Find those passionate people, find those creative people, nurture that creativity, and the contributions will flow in. All right, you've thought about how to do this for your community. You personally want to mentor. First and foremost, know yourself. This is incredibly important because people tend to jump into things with great enthusiasm, and introspection is the mother of effective enthusiasm. So some fairly basic ideas. If you, you know, if you know that you are in one time zone and this person who looks really promising in your community is, you know, 13 hour time difference away, maybe you're not the right mentor. Uh, if you find yourself saying RTFM in your head and then backspacing, backspace, 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 uh, when answering questions, maybe you want to think about that before you start mentoring. Or maybe you want to mentor someone who's a little more advanced. Just take the time to think through what your needs are, what your personality is like, to make sure that you make a good choice when you choose someone to mentor. And also something very, very basic that I think a lot of folks tend to forget. Um, think very hard and long about your communication preferences and make sure that you find someone who matches that. There is nothing more frustrating than trying to work effectively with someone when they want to pick up the phone and call you and you're not a phone person, you're really an email person. Or there's nothing more difficult than somebody who only wants to work like via IM or IRC when you really prefer email communication because it's asynchronous in time. Make sure you bring that up as well with your mentee uh, early on and actually state to them, like, I really like to work by email. How does that work for you? Because otherwise you may find that ha having not been explicit in that expectation that you've got a mismatch. Perfectionism is the mother of ineffectiveness. We all like beer, clearly. This is the Duval Brewery in Belgium. But we don't want to produce, you know, carbon cutouts of each other. This is not an assembly line. And one of the most important things when you're starting to mentor, because you are knowledgeable and because you are very excited to help someone be successful, is it's really hard to watch them make mistakes. You want to jump in and correct early and correct often. And it's very easy to forget that some of the best lessons you yourself have learned as someone who's experienced were through your failures. Don't be afraid to let someone that you're working with fail. Fail early, fail often, course correct. But don't let that, that sense of uh, desire to see them be incredibly successful or even your own inherent desire for quality. Um, you may have noticed that folks in the open source world, myself included, tend to like to do things right the first time. Your newbies will start doing things right the first time a little bit further along. Um, patience seems like an obvious one, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, exercise your patience. There are going to be times when, in interacting with any human being, particularly someone that you're trying to teach, they're going to do things that may drive you crazy. Like you're trying to get them to walk up the stairs and they're walking across the stairs. Not, probably not meeting their goal. Again, take a deep breath. You were new once too. Take a moment to chill out and go from there. And if you find that you're in a situation where you feel like your personal reserves are being taxed a bit too much, that's cool. Ask for help. That's why you have a project community. It's not only on you. Have great expectations. People will live up to your thoughts about how successful or not successful they can be, um, in my experience, unerringly. If you look at someone and you know that they can do great things, and you tell them that they can do great things, they will, if you're there to help them out when there are bumps along the way. And it's really important not to set high barriers to entry or to suggest to someone that within one week they have to be the lead hacksaw of the project. That's a little too intimidating. But just let folks know that you've seen their capabilities 
This is some of the best prose I've seen in any documentation. It's incredibly clear. This code is really beautifully written. This was a very elegant solution. I look forward to seeing more of that from you. Wow, this logo is so amazing. So many more people really understand our project brand now that you've drawn this for us, et cetera. Have high goals, and that's a good and beautiful thing, and be there to help your mentee reach them. The most important thing here is communication. Communication is key. If you have an idea, a set of expectations, you need to make those expectations clear. Um, I was in Denise and Mark's talk on Dreamwith, um, which honestly I think they should just be giving again now instead of this talk. <laughs> and uh, one of the great points that they made was you have to be explicit in setting your expectations. Document what you expect from your community. So if you expect people to be mentors and to be teachers in your community, you need to set that out as part of your goals. Likewise, just general communication with your mentee, you cannot over-communicate. I know that, you know, it's a busy world. We tend to try to not fill each other's inboxes with extraneous messages. But it's, it's so important to make sure that you're both on the same page. Just do those daily, weekly, whatever you guys have agreed to, check-ins to see how things are going. Uh, you may find, especially if you're working with someone who is very, very smart, that they've been beating their head against the wall of a particular problem for days because they didn't want to bother you or they thought they should figure it out on their own. And it's actually a really easy problem and something that almost everyone runs into. And you could have saved them all that time and frustration if you'd just taken the time to reach out to them and say, hey, how's it going? Share your mistakes. This is one of my favorites. Um, can anyone spot what is wrong with this picture? Yes, thank you very much. You can hold your breathe. I can't hold my breathe, I talk too fast. But in any case, this is actually a sign at Disney World, so apparently the Disney Corporation is not perfect, whatever they would like to tell us. So, why is it important to share your mistakes? Well, it's, I think it's very difficult for some of us to realize just how intimidating coming into the world of open source can be for folks who haven't been there before, or just even coming into any new group can be for those who haven't been there before. And it's very important to let them know that you know you too are flawed. You too have had issues. Um, when I first started working on, on open source for Google, I uh, literally shared a cubicle with the guy who wrote the book on open source software. Like literally, the book. Producing open source software by Carl Fogel. Needless to say, this was a bit intimidating. Maybe really intimidating. <laughs> And, uh, you know, every day when I would be working through a new problem, you know, Carl would share an anecdote uh, from various projects that he'd worked on with me where someone else had had the exact same problem, the exact same difficulty. And it made me feel really good and empowered to know that there had been other people who had been in that same bind. There had been other people who had tripped up. There were people who had made the exact same mistake that I had, and they'd been doing this for 10 years. And that really made me feel like, as many times as I would stumble, as many times as I would make a mistake, and in a very public forum, which we're all taught, you know, make your mistakes in private or don't make them at all, I was still going to be successful. So take the time to let folks know where you've had your most tremendous screw up. Uh, some folks also recommend, um, I haven't tried this tactic myself as much, but it can be helpful with a newcomer who's less confident. Actually make an easy mistake. Do something that'll be easy for them to catch and correct so that they know that you too are not some infallible creature whom they must look up to all. And also so that they know that they can maintain that open dialogue with you. So that they know that they can question because it's through that questioning that our projects and our communities improve. Give guidance. Guidance is important. But steer, don't drive. It's very important to let folks experience their own creativity. It's very important for people to work through problems in their own way. Of course, you want to course correct when you need to. Sorry, hang on a sec. If you have long hair, do not use this mic. It's very important to course correct when you need to. But again, you want to make sure that you let your mentee have that space and that freedom to figure out how they want to get things done. Talk to them about project plans. Talk to them about future development. Talk to them about what they're thinking, but in the end, let them go off and execute and do it the way they think it needs to be done so that they feel empowered and they feel like they're doing something great and not just marching to orders. 
Because nobody thinks that's fun. And you want people to have fun. So we've talked a little bit about starting off a mentor-mentee relationship, a little bit about where to find newbies. I think the most important thing for folks to remember is that if you want people to stick around long term, recognition equals retention. Acknowledging someone's contributions in whatever way is appropriate for your project, maybe it's cheering them in IRC, maybe it's shooting them a mail saying, hey, I really appreciated that patch you sent in, it fixed something that's been bugging me forever. Uh, maybe putting a note up on the website like contributor of the day or contributor of the week, so and so did awesome thing X, Y, and Z. The more you acknowledge people's contributions, particularly at the beginning, the more they will feel invested in continuing to spend their free time working on your free software. So take the time to recognize accomplishments, no matter how small they may seem, and also take the time to accomplish great, to celebrate great accomplishments. Part of the fun of being in a community is that you're a group of people who care about each other, and part of caring about each other is sharing those moments of joy with one another. I think the coolest thing that I've seen is I have, there's one project that has it set up so that in their uh, developer channel, every time someone makes a commit, there's a little IRC bot that says, blah, 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 so-and-so has made a commit. And uh, everybody takes a moment to applaud during a hack day. So I think that's pretty cool, something you might want to use. And recognition equals delegating. This again can be, again, difficult because someone's new. They don't have the kind of wealth of knowledge that you do. They don't have that kind of experience. Sometimes you just need to hand over the keys to the kingdom and say, go forth, have fun, enjoy, get good stuff done. And then realize that the resulting work that comes back to you may not be the way you would have done it, but it's still beautiful and it still gets the job done. And be very comfortable as people get more and more advanced in their knowledge, delegating more and more to them. And it may be even something that you really personally enjoy doing, something that you really find exciting and actually you'd kind of rather do it yourself. But if that's where their skill set is and you want to see them become a, a more full contributor to your project and keep on giving more and more to the community and being more and more effective, delegate. Fear not, it will all be okay. And, you know, eventually they might get tired of it and you can go back to doing it all yourself if you want to. Talked before about knowing yourself and I just wanted to conclude this presentation with, uh, at least from my own experience, I think the most valuable aspect of taking that time to mentor new people is knowing yourself. I talked to several mentors from the Summer of Code program and every time they talk about their experiences, I hear frequently how much they learned about themselves, how much more they learned about being a better developer because they had to be more disciplined because they were working with a new person. I hear all about how they realized that there were problems when they were communicating what they thought was crystal clear, made no sense to anybody else. This is an opportunity for you to learn and grow personally, and it's a valuable one, and I hope that you folks will take up the charge and want to become fabulous mentors yourselves. So, a few resources for those of you interested in mentoring. Uh, we have the Google Summer of Code Mentoring Guide, which is uh, a Creative Commons document. It's partially geared toward the Summer of Code, but in general, it just has some pretty awesome thoughts and tips about mentoring. Uh, it was produced in three days in a documentation sprint with the Floss Manuals Project, and it's there for anybody to improve. And my not-so-secret wish is that someone will take this documentation and fork it into an overall guide for mentoring for open source projects. So if you're bored and haven't decided that you want to start mentoring yet, but you'd like to get up to speed, please feel free to learn more by reading the documentation and retwibbling it. Uh, Esther Schindler has written a beautiful article in IT World about mentoring in open source communities, what's effective, what's not. That's another excellent resource. And there have been many great talks at LCA uh, about this particular topic. As I mentioned, uh, Mark and Denise's talk on DreamWidth, Matthew Garrett's talk yesterday on who is the Linux community and recognizing contributions more widely. Um, I know Angela Byron has talked about this. Josh uh, Burkus and Selena Deckelman will be giving a talk on this topic as well. And uh, my very own colleague, Kat Allman, and I will be giving a talk on open source for newbies uh, right after lunch as well. So it's great to see this meme is so important at this conference, and it's great to see that this meme and this theme is so important to our community right now. Because as we go on and bring more folks into the wide world of open source, we really need to be mindful of how to do that well. So my dear friends, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please shout them out. If not, we can all go have a delicious kebab.
Nam. <clears throat> it, oh, no. I promised if James asked a question that I would do it in a terrible accent for the answer. Now I don't even remember which accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Leslie, what's been your biggest challenge as, uh, as a nerd herder? As a nerd herder? Yeah. Do I have to do the funny accent? Uh, yeah. <sighs> I'm not going to. I'm, I'm welching on our deal. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, James asked what's been uh, my biggest challenge as a nerd herder. Um, I think my biggest challenge as a nerd herder has been that I, as a one human being, don't scale. Um, we're very proud of the Google Open Source Programs Office of doing more with less, and that includes fewer people. And for the first year, I was the only person really focused on the Summer of Code program. And we had 600 students and 1,000 mentors, and there were an awful lot of people, and they needed stuff, right? And, and as Denise was mentioning uh, yesterday, it is very important when you're building a community to be available and to be responsive and to really show people that their voice is heard and that they're acknowledged and that their contribution, whatever it is, is valued. And, you know, it is really, really hard when there's a lot of them and one of you or a lot of them and a few of you. And uh, I learned to drink more Diet Coke. And it worked really, really well, I might add. <laughs> And we got more humans, and that was huge, too. So Kat has been a huge help. Uh, Ellen Co. has been a huge help. So we've been adding more staff to the team over time, and that's been awesome. Uh, hi. Um, the, I really like the check your tone point. Um, Thank and you. I was wondering that short of meeting someone's mother, do you have any tips <laughs> on how to actually do that? Um, so the question is, uh, short of actually having uh, someone's mom come on down and meet the community, are there better ways to check your tone? Um, when, uh, so there's a couple different experiments you can run. Um, one, ask your most sensitive friend to take a look, lurk in your IRC channel and see if there's something said that would bother him or her. Um, think about whether or not you'd say whatever it is that you're saying to somebody who you didn't really know because I, there's a lot of talk in open source projects about keeping your communications professional. And I don't know that that's necessarily the best watchword to provide because open source projects aren't necessarily professional, right? This is a group of, of friends and colleagues who want to get together to accomplish something awesome. And if you suddenly feel like you all have to address each other very properly and talk about the weather and everybody's health and how is everyone today and become wooden robototrons, no one's going to have a good time. But at the same time, and, and Matthew Garrett made this point very effectively yesterday in his talk about the Linux community, you don't have to be uh, lacking in personality to, to, to still be a welcoming community. And it's, it's also worth saying that if you communicate more informally, if you do call each other idiots, you know, be willing to be mindful when there are new people around. Did somebody new join your mailing list? If, there's, if so, and you call each other idiots, do you have it documented somewhere on your mailing list guide? We tend to be pretty informal communicators because we all know and love each other. So sometimes we say things and you think, wow, what is wrong with these people? We don't want that to bother you. Please come on in. And if somebody says something to you that really makes you feel like you're not welcome here, it's our responsibility to make you feel welcome, but it's your responsibility to let us know that you feel uncomfortable. Um, and in general, just don't do things that are obviously bad. I mean, I don't, we're all adults here. I don't need to tell anybody that, you know, making comments about people's body parts or whatever is just not useful to anyone. So just don't do it. Which do you find more effective, one-on-one -on -one mentoring or one student being mentored by a group of people? Inevitably, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, in, in cases where uh, for our student programs, there are mentors. Do we find it more effective to have one-to-one -one mentors or a student being mentored by a group of people? And while that's highly project dependent, um, and especially for some of the smaller projects where you're inevitably going to have a one-to-one -one ratio because there aren't a lot of folks to mentor, the group mentoring model I think works much, much more effectively. And I also think it works much, much more effectively in the sense of getting folks engaged with the wider community. If someone is used to only talking to you, if, that, uh, if there's always one-to-one -one communication, there accompanies that, accompanying that there's this natural hesitancy to do things like post patches to a mailing list or to work openly or to talk in the IRC channel because 
that bond and connection is being formed just with you. It's more of a one-to-one -one friend relationship. In the case of group mentoring, you're getting uh, many different perspectives, which I think is highly valuable to uh, the student contributor. There are more people to share the load of mentoring, more people to answer questions, more people to give guidance. And I also just think it makes people feel good to know that this many people are behind them in their success, right? Oh, wow, you know, it's not just my mentor cares what happens to me. It's my mentor cares, Jane cares, Bob cares, Alana cares, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty degree. You mentioned uh, students as a way of getting new contributors. Do you have yes. any other specifics or, or places that we can search for new contributors? I'm going, so the question is, uh, beyond students, other ways to search for new contributors. And I'm going to give you a somewhat Weasley lawyer-esque answer. And the answer is, it depends. It really depends on, on what you're looking for. Do you have like a specific need that I could give you suggestions for? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're a political open source project. So in that case, I mean, depending on the, the particular politics of the project, there are a couple of different uh, avenues to go down. One thing that I uh, heard from a couple of different groups was they found a lot of sympathy when they had particular political action causes, not just among students, but among other groups who were doing political action causes uh, in general in that kind of area. So the environmentalists were finding that they got uh, a lot of help and support from civic planning activists because those two causes seem to go hand in hand. Um, and don't be afraid to uh, just, you know, recruit from friends and family and be, you know, kind of like, hey, spread the word about this cool thing that I'm doing because you love me and you'll just sort of find people trickling in. Do you mind if I ask what the politics of your project are? Open Australia. Oh, well, you can also, like, ask your friends at Google to, like, host you in the Sydney office and put up a post on our blog about how awesome you are. I know. <laughs> Did that help? Not yet, but it will soon. Excellent. Hmm. One Let me thing. Go on. Pardon? Your mic isn't on. Yes, it is. I haven't started talking yet. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I didn't want to talk over somebody else. Yeah. One. If you get involved with our project, then you get something out of it. You get a, a bit of CV. Well, you know, there's a whole bunch of high-profile people who, who happily back you up in an interview because you've demonstrated you've got skills and da, da 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 And references and stuff like that to a student, or particularly a graduate, are really valuable. One thing that I thought was really one of the cool and interesting things that's happened to me recently is I attended uh, the inaugural kickoff meeting of the FSF's, excuse me, the Free Software Foundation's, uh, kickoff meeting for the new women in free software group. And it was a small group of women who were coming together to talk about some of the issues of women participating in free software. And the facilitator for the discussion was actually a woman whose last name I can't remember now, which is embarrassing, Hillary. She had been a huge leader in the labor rights movement. And she was talking about how framing the debate about women participating in free software wasn't really about software, but it was actually about freedom of speech and about human rights. And I think you'd actually find that your, the, your particular cause would be of great value to folks who do things like labor rights, who do things like rights for native peoples, et cetera, et cetera, because that's all about, the nice thing about open is it's open and it's about really allowing everyone access to freedom and the joys that go along with that, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I have five minutes. I can talk for five minutes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm involved in the Lily Pond community, and most, one of the things we found helpful in getting newbies in is to create a list of easy tasks that uh, people can start doing. Mm -hmm. The problem is Lily Pond's aimed at musicians as users, and they tend not to be programmers. So the kinds of people who actually want to help don't have any of the right skills to be able to help, and that's, that's our main big problem. I, so the question is, uh, in a situation where most of the folks who come in and want to help are users and you have coding tasks that need to be done, how do you help? And I'm going to let Denise answer that question. Teach them. You can train people to code a lot easier than you can train them to give the, the passionate response to your project. That's actually what we're doing with Dream with Studios. Over 60% of our contributors have never touched programming before. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, we have been trying to do that and in introducing people to Scheme and to the, the, the Lillipop program. It's just that uh, it doesn't seem to work as well as we want it to. When you, when you say that as you're introducing people to these tasks, it doesn't work as well as you want it to, um, what particular problem are you having? It doesn't oh, stick, just they don't... The, the, the problem is that the code base is so huge that in order to do any of the tasks that really need to be done, there's about a year's learning curve to, to, to get there, and it's just too big. Are, so if, yeah. uh, if the difficulty is that you have a very large code base, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with your project, so I can't give a good answer to this, but are there... Is there any way to break off those things into bite-sized well, chunks? Th there are small things, and they're the ones we've listed as the, the beginner's tasks. Mm -hmm. And people are doing those. But they never seem to graduate to doing the big, the big difficult ones, so there's about four developers who are totally overloaded. Is it, so, okay, so is it possible to, if they're accomplishing beginner's tasks really well, is, there, is it possible to identify sort of the next step up task, or is it beginner or expert, and that middle ground is very difficult? The middle ground is hard. <clears throat> anyway. Well, think on that. Yeah. One thing that I think would be interesting, and um, I'll give you his contact information afterwards, but uh, the group uh, Open Hatch that I mentioned before, my friend Ashish is actually working on um, trying to figure out how to scope a medium ground difficulty task because it's really easy for projects to pick out easy things and really easy for them to pick out expert things, and that middle ground is really hard. So he's actually doing a lot of work with some of his colleagues on how you scope that sort of middle ground task. So maybe the two of you should have a good conversation about that. Other folks? Yeah. Um, I, I actually, my point was kind of following up on that, and that with Inkscape we've seen that too, is that if you get some of the users, you can teach them, and sometimes you'll get them transitioning to those harder tasks. And we've had this past month, one of, or few months actually, one of our artists actually doing patches. And That's not just awesome. applying patches, but actual bug fix patches. It took a transition step to go between them, but at hand. And we probably need to get together because among other things, I think with Lily Pond, you've got a very interesting potential target because those who are musically inclined also have the proper mind to handle programming. And I have found that. So math, music, and programming really overlap. So you do have a good pool of people there. And there you go. Clearly, you should be targeting musicians for Open Australia, sir. <laughs> um, one of the things that, going back to the, the learning curve of getting into new projects, um, if you attended LCA in 2007 in Sydney, uh, a wonderful woman, very smart woman, uh, uh, Kathy Sierra spoke, um, mm -hmm. you know, creating passionate users. Uh, absolutely recommend it. I think it's still for download um, on the LCA website. Uh, fantastic talk. And what she talked about was like when you were designing software um, that you create it so that it's like more like a game rather than this big lump of software. And so, you know, the user comes in and they, they get challenged and then like once they beat that challenge, you know, there's a whole bunch of new things that have opened up, um, you know, that open up to them and then you can kind of progress up the levels in kind of this granular way. So you become... Uh, from a not you go from novice to advanced user, but in lots of small incremental steps. Um, and I've had the the absolute pleasure of uh, mentoring uh, an intern on my uh, team at work, um, and uh, Belinda. And she was originally given work that was like go and change some templates on our product. You know, like fix some spelling mistakes. That's what she started with on the first day. And by the end of the first two weeks, she was, you know, like writing web code, and it was really cool. Um, and so one of the things that, like, you could tell she was a very intelligent woman, and, like, you know, it was like uh, she was getting all of the kind of, because she's the intern, she's getting all kind of crap jobs. And so she looked a bit bored, and um, we we're working over Christmas break, and I'm like, hey, um, can you help me out with this thing, which was a little bit more advanced than what she was doing. And throughout the week, we actually sat there together, and she was, at the end of it, debugging all of this really scary code back from 2003 oh God. that, mm, like, two people in the company understand. And by taking it as a granular approach and kind of, like, every time they do a new bit of work, you throw them in the deep end just a little bit, and they learn. And I think this can also be applied to open source projects. You just need to give, have the patience and give people the opportunity to learn themselves. Mm -hmm. On Dreamwith, we actually uh, refer to that as leveling up. 
Awesome. <laughs> if everybody's played video games, you gain experience points in programming for doing the little things, and that leads you into the more complex, and you level up in your programming job task. Right. I also find that um, it works better if it has like a kind of the leveling up has like this interesting angle to it. Like if you find something that you go, oh, this person is really keen about this, then kind of spin it with that kind of angle and get them not only to do the task that needs to be done, but get them to do a little bit more to make it exciting, to make it a little bit different rather than, you know, it just being hacking, you know. We've got time for one more question. No? Thank you all very, very, very much for coming. And I will be around at the conference the rest of the week and at Open Day if you have any questions or want to chat. And life is good. Thanks, folks. <laughs>